So this is a very unfortunate 43-year-old lady who had uh, peripartum uh, endocarditis, and, uh, and it was really a terrible, uh, terrible situation for her. She eventually had to have tricuspid valve replacement, and she had an epicardial pacemaker implanted, and that's back in 2004. In 2019, she has new onset of atrial fibrillation, and by this time, she's on metoprolol, metolazone, and bumetanide, and she gets a T cardioversion. So this is all done elsewhere. So we have access to the reports, and this is what's written right there. So normal LV size function, right atrium severely enlarged, bioprosthetic valve present, tricuspid valve leaflets not well seen, Vmax 0.9, half time 82 milliseconds, no significant stenosis, and she started on warfarin and cardioverted. Now, in case you were wondering what, uh, what's the talk about pressure half-time and valve area and all those things, these are from the European and American guidelines of, uh, uh, for assessing prosthetic valves. And you can see there's uh, uh, agreement about the gradient more than six would be abnormal. There's agreement uh, about high velocity with different cutoff points, though, 1.7, 1.9, and the pressure half-time differs a little bit between the two guidelines. Now, the US ones are just being revised. They are kind of long in a 12-year-old. So, all right, so this is the echo. So, remember, it's a TE cardioversion, okay? So, all, all the images are focused on the left side, looking at the appendage, this, that. And these are the only views that we have of the tricuspid valve. I don't know. So, you guys look at that and think what you think. We'll have questions about this. Then in 2019, she has recurrent atrial fibrillation in October. And then she, uh, she actually gets a transthoracic echocardiogram this time, looking at, uh, at everything she has. And again, severely dilated right atrium, no pathologic regurgitation. Gradients are normal in one sentence, but a little high in the other sentence, so, so maybe it's the template that was pulled in and not corrected. I, I suspect that's, that's probably the case. But, uh, but what it says is borderline increased gradients. All right, so this is the echo with the refib. So left side, not much to be seen there. Right side, not much to be seen there. Short axis and um, apical four in the, in the routine format with the left ventricle on the right side and the right ventricle on the left side. Mean gradient that was reported was eight and pressure half time of 100 milliseconds. So Jeremy, Buzz, Nish, any, any thoughts so far? That's a very abnormal looking valve. Um... So the, you know, it, it, it's hard, um, you, you know, echo can be positional, so, um, but if we assume on the images on the right that they're actually cutting through the leaflets, I think you can see one strut, um, the leaflets look very abnormal, and there's just a small area of color flow uh, through the tri uh, which which would suggest significant uh, stenosis. With the, uh, with the mean gradient being only eight, it could be that the stroke volume is low. I mean, so that could limit it, just like we were talking about before. And for patients in sinus rhythm, <coughs> which she is right at that time, the, uh, the A coming up can actually sh falsely shorten the deceleration time, and so it can be a false so opinion of the valve area from the half time. So again, we have no clinical exam because this is all outside, so just remember that part. Don't, don't, don't fault me for not examining the patient, okay? So now it's March in 2020, so she starts having left neck pain. She's taking Tylenol for that. The swelling gets worse over the next three days, in the arm and the breast. And after three days, she has sudden onset of acute shortness of breath, and she walks uh, to a local ED. So, Anybody wants to do a CT on this lady? I take it, I hope. Acute onset, well. So this is what she has, so I'll let it play. Um, and you can appreciate there's clear evidence of uh, pulmonary embolism. You could see it there in the left, there's some in the right. There's also something in the right atrium. 
And this is the report, acute pulmonary emboli, feeling defect in the right atrium concerning for thrombus. I feel always uh, uh, good when, when the CT asks ECHO to look for thrombus, you know, so it's, it's a bonus for us. Uh, swelling inflammatory change in left axilla and left breast correlate with exam. Uh, so this is what she has at this point in time. So remember, she has been on warfarin anticoagulation. She has been on warfarin anticoagulation, yet she develops this massive thrombosis of the subclavian um, axillary uh, vein uh, with extension into the arm. Uh, so is this a warfarin failure? She gets consult in the hospital from hematology to discuss about malignancy and things like that, and she's put on rivaroxaban. So what do you want to do? All right, so most of you want to do all of the above, the underlying malignancy, thrombophilia workup, and referral to tertiary center. Uh, all of the above is not a bad idea, but, but let's, let's do this. So this is the way I, I'd like to, to look at uh, uh, prosthetic valves in general. So there's four steps, and all four are equally important, really. And if you miss one, you'll probably miss your diagnosis. You need to know about the patient and about the valve. You need to look. Remember, the visual cues are there, and you should not ignore them, much like we had the calcified aortic valve that doesn't move. Then you measure. So the measurement comes after you knew and you looked, OK? Uh, then put everything together. And if we do that for our own patient, what we know is that she has a 16-year-old bioprosthesis and she's symptomatic. So these are the things we know about the patient. And we look, and as Jeremy pointed out, um, the valve looks kind of sort of abnormal. And the key question in this patient is why in the world a young woman of 44 years of age, tonight and metolazone, if the right ventricle is normal, and the corollary is why in the world is the right atrium giantly enlarged if everything else is fine with the valve? So you need to answer those two questions. And really, if you look at your TE that we showed, that we've seen all of us, and you look carefully, you see that on your left side, that would be the prosthetic ring, and inside, you see the degenerated the immobile cusp. I'm going to let it play just one more time. Just watch it. It's coming. You see the ring? Something inside. You see the ring? Something inside that doesn't move. So that's an immobilized leaflet. And the other thing that you see on the right side, you can see there's regurgitation that wasn't reported. And look carefully. There's laminated thrombus right there. So, so these are things that you can miss if you're in a rush. So just be, be cautious with, with your evaluation. And what Larry Sinak, who's one of our master echocardiographers, likes to say, you need what you're looking at, and you need to know what you're looking for, okay? So that's important. The other thing that we had and didn't look for, and the radiologist didn't say a word about that, just look at, at the, the leaflets. How often do you see the leaflets brighter than the contrast in the cavity? Just look at that. The leaflets are brighter than the contrast. So those are heavily calcified leaflets. So do not ignore that part. It's, it's there. You had it for free. And what Nish said, you know, really, the gradient was high, velocity was high, and the pressure half time is actually high if you measure on this. So everything points out that you have severe, uh, severe uh, problem with the valve. Uh, one thing with, the, with the, the Doppler indices, remember that they don't always work. We have recently looked at that for aortic valve prosthesis than tricuspid valve. But remember that sometimes these are patients who have obstruction and these are patients who have regurgitation as a mechanism of failure. Axial time didn't work very well for, for, for us. So the algorithm in general, it's accurate about 50 to 60 percent uh, of the time. So there's room for improvement there. So we go back to all the four steps. Old valve, calcified cusp, prosthetic obstruction and regurgitation, and that means the prosthesis is degenerated. That's a bad valve. And if you look at the TEE, there's not a gap missing in here. That's just acoustic, acoustic shadowing from the ring. So two leaflets clearly immobilize. The third one, you don't see it, but it's still immobilized. Look at the uh, 2D. Question, how bad is the regurgitation? It's amazing to me, because this patient has a valve that's stuck, not open, not closed. We measured the, the valve opening area. In systole, it's 1.1. In diastole, it's 1.1. 1 
So she has an ERO of 1.1. She has similar, at the same time, severe stenosis and severe regurgitation. And actually, this is how the valve looked like when, uh, Amar, uh, when uh, uh, Dr. Agami, who's one of our brilliant young surgeon, took it out. He put the valve on the shelf and knocked it with the, with the forceps. It sounded like crystal, like porcelain, you know? So it's a heavily calcified valve. So that's what she had. She had to redo valve replacement. She had a reduction in atrioplasty. We had to replace the pacemaker. And she's doing actually fairly well. So the take home points for this one, remember those four steps every time you, you assess a prosthetic valve. Look, measure, uh, and know, put everything together. Recognize that bioprosthesis will not last for, for too long, 16 years, it's already pretty good, and understand the limitation of Doppler indices.